In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny. Allahumma <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we are now in this uh, fourth lesson <coughs> in the mini series that has to do with the prophethood of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And uh, now that we have kind of discussed the Holy Quran as the main miracle of the Holy Prophet, so one part of the discussion had to do with the Quran as a miracle and the miraculous nature of the Quran. We then concentrated on the second, perhaps the most important topic around the Holy Quran, which is the authenticity of the Quran. So we're done with those points. So now we go back to the prophethood of the Prophet. Now that that topic is done with, the, the main miracle of the Prophet. Uh, so we go back to his prophethood. And there's basically two big uh, subtopics left. And they're very, very interrelated, very interconnected. So we're going to talk about them today and the lesson is built in this way, so I'm following the same structure of the lesson. Uh, so today what we have is the discussion about the universal nature of Islam and then we'll talk about the arguments for that and then the final nature, so it, that it, it is a final religion, there is no more religion after it. So in other words, if we want to use uh, a little bit more uh, let's say, more distinguishing terms, we would say it's the eternity of Islam. So basically, Islam is going to be good until the end of times, the end of, until the Day of Judgment. And then, from another angle, that same topic, inshallah, we're going to discuss next time. So this is the second half of this argument about the final religion. We're going to discuss it in the next lesson. And that one is specifically going to be about what do we mean when we say the Holy Prophet is the seal of prophets, al khatamiyyah What does the khatamiyyah mean? That he is the last of prophets. So of course, in one way, there's an overlap with what we're saying here that this is a final religion and he is the final prophet. Okay, so half of that topic is going to be addressed today and the other half is going to be addressed in the next lesson and we'll finish that, uh, that one. And I know that we've had a couple of discussions about our religion in previous lessons related to this mini-series that I'm leaving till that lesson. So, we'll see if you get, I get interest and questions from them or not. If, if I don't, then I'm gonna put the questions myself and, and add them in the last uh, lesson. So the overview of this lesson or the structure of this lesson is basically uh, a short introduction where he kind of sets the tone for uh, you know, asking the question in the right way or why would we wonder about this question of the universality and the final uh, Islam being the final, the finality, I don't want to use finality, but the finality of Islam. Okay, so Islam as a final religion or a, in, an eternal religion. Once this is done, then we're going to concentrate on establishing the argument for both sides. So, uh, part one, first half of the lesson is going to be what is the argument that this religion is actually a universal religion? And then the second part, and so in this lesson, when we're going to talk about it in a second, the author is really going to concentrate on the Quranic uh, argument, and we'll see, we'll see why. But we said that when we introduced the topic of prophethood, especially as we moved through it, we said now we're slowly starting to shift, whereas before we were concentrating on only exclusively rational arguments, now we're starting to slowly move into the scriptural arguments and now we can because we now establish that the Quran is authentic and reliable so it's a valid argument that I can rely on it right I can just say and the Quran says so the order of the the logic of your argument is going to count for a lot depending on what you're trying to argue and we'll come back to that in a second and then the same thing for the finality so that, the, that Islam is the final religion, that it has the eternal character from the time it is revealed <coughs> until the end of times. And then at the end he adds very quickly three, I believe three, we'll see, I think three objections to this whole topic of the universality of Islam and Islam being an eternal religion, and he'll answer them quickly. So maybe it'll trigger even more objections in your minds, and then we'll, I'm guessing in the next time we'll, we'll address those. <laughs> so, in the introduction, 
we are reminded of what we have said until now. So we take bits and pieces of things that we've mostly established first in general prophethood and then in, in specific prophethood. We've clearly established by now that we are expected to believe in all divine <coughs> prophets and all of their teachings and all of their scriptures and all of their religions. The moment you say that there is a revelation from God and you consider that reliable and authentic, you must believe in it. So, and we've established that rationally. We said that so long as someone is actually sent from God, they meet all the criteria, then they must be believed in. And then when we came to the Holy Prophet, we used the, that same argumentation, we, we used the same logic that we put in place, the principles that we put in place in general prophethood, and we applied it to the Holy Prophet and we established that <coughs> Islam can be uh, established as being valid, as being authentic, as being genuine religion in the same manner. So we established the prophethood of the Holy Prophet and the validity of the Quran as his main miracle and as scripture. So until now, when we look at all of this, all we've established is, and although the, the, the question we've actually touched on it in the past, what someone may say at this point, <coughs> what someone, there are people coming, uh, what someone may say is, if someone has been sent from God, if there is something that we can consider to be a reliable, valid, genuine scripture, genuine teaching, as in a religion, a genuine prophet sent from God, then wouldn't that mean that we can follow any of them, or shouldn't it mean that we follow all of them? And we've already touched on this, we've actually answered this question quickly in the past, so now we have to rebuild on it and then move specifically into Islam. So what we said, and specifically in Lesson 29, when we talked about the multiplicity of prophethoods, the, the, that we have many religions, many scriptures, many prophets, we said it does not mean that we can follow any of them. And it does not mean that we can follow all of them either. And this is where we talked about the importance of knowing what your duty is. There is a responsibility that touches you. Depending on where you are and when you are living, there is a specific theological or religious duty on you to follow a certain prophet. And this becomes even more evident in the cases where we see that there are multiple prophets living together. I, th I think we may, ha may have, for instance, mentioned <coughs> that Prophet Lut lived at the same time as Prophet Ibrahim. And it's not that there is a big difference, but if you're living with Prophet Lut, Prophet Lut will tell you, are you to follow him or to go back to Ibrahim? Right? So every people are supposed to fall under their own specific duty, depending on when you are existing and where you are existing, there is a specific duty that is related to you. So we cannot take the rational argument we established to say, <coughs> The moment we have established that someone is a prophet of God and that they have genuine divine teachings, a scripture and a religion, then we can jump from there to, and therefore we can follow any of them as we choose, and we can follow any of their scriptures as we choose, or we can follow all of them. So I can pick and choose a little bit from here, a little bit from there. That's not how it works. You have to know what is your duty. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need from you or want from you? Specifically, you as a person, you as a community, who are you supposed to be following? So when we come to the topic of Islam from there, now the question becomes, okay, so we've established that the Holy Prophet is a prophet sent from God, and that we've established that his scripture is a scripture sent from God, and we've looked at that, that it's authentic, and that it's miraculous, and that it's valid, and it's the same as it was revealed to him. Someone may say, so why do I need to follow it today? So that could be the person who is not a Muslim, or even the Muslim who's wondering, or the person trying to invite others to Islam. What right do you have to invite someone to your religion if you don't first establish that the duty of people today is to go back to Islam and adhere to Islam? All you've established until now is that he is 
a prophet like many other prophets and that he has a scripture like any other scripture. But someone may still say, and I will keep looking and I may choose to follow him or follow any other prophet. And I may choose, assuming that there are other scriptures that are valid, I may choose this scripture or any other, any other scripture. So where's the issue? So here's where we have to fall into this, finalize the argument and say, what is people's duty today? What is people's duty today? Do they need to follow this religion or not? And to do that, the question is, to what extent can we consider Islam to be the religion that people can choose? <coughs> How do I know that today, 14 centuries after Prophet Muhammad, and in the future, this is the religion that I need to follow? When the Holy Prophet was sent not to me, I may be living anywhere in the world, he was sent to a specific community, living at a specific period in time, in a specific location on earth, how does that apply to me? He was sent to the Arabs, he was sent to his family, he was sent to 14 centuries ago. How do I extend that teaching to my life today? Okay, so that's the argument of the universality. And then we're going to touch on the second part, when we said we're going to touch on it, we're, gonna, we're not going to finish it today. We're going to see the other aspect of it in the next lesson, and that will be the last lesson in this series, which is, how do I know that if I follow it today, there has not been other religions that have been revealed since, or that will not be revealed in the future? So this is the eternity, or the finality, the, final, the, the, the nature of Islam being the final religion, the final scripture. Okay? So this is the uh, structure of the lesson. And as we said, now the author is going to establish first the argument that Islam is actually a universal religion. So that's part one. And then the second part of the lesson is establishing that this is the final religion or slash an eternal religion. <coughs> so continuing with the introduction, and he doesn't spend a lot of time on this, he mentions it quickly, but I wanted to make sure that it's uh, kept in mind. From a methodology point of view, from someone who wants to use arguments logically and not make those methodological mistakes. Notice where we started talking about this topic. We had to establish the existence of God, the necessity of religion, everything that we said in general prophethood. We established the prophethood of <coughs> Prophet Muhammad. We established the validity, the genuineness, the authenticity, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Now we can talk about, and is Islam universal or not? And is Islam final or not? If those points have not been established first, if there is still doubt about those points, those points need to be put to rest first. You can't just jump into whether it's a universal religion or not, okay? The second point, and this one he doesn't really dwell on, he mentions it in passing, but this is a point I really want to make sure we understand. This is where you start to see, and this is the importance of the logical sequence, where there's a shortcoming in our reason. You cannot establish with reason alone that a religion is now needed. You can have some indications that, s that tell you maybe this is a point where humanity would require a new religion. But you will not ever be able to have the full picture and all the, in the criteria that will say we must have a new religion here or it's, it's very easy after the fact to do. We can rationalize why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have sent a new religion. But looking before it would have been sent, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say or can decide a new religion is needed at this point in time and to this people. Otherwise, we don't know. We said that this is going to require the, all the criteria that have to do with individuals and societies collectively and as they unfold in the future. What is humanity going to require in, in 100 years? In 100 years or 200? I don't know. How is it going to change? I don't know. Is the religion that we have today going to be sufficient for them in the future? I don't know. Allah knows. And that's why He's the only one who can determine when a new religion is going to be required or not. And what we're really talking about, whether a religion is now universal or not, whether a religion is going to be the final one or not, 
really the question is, do we need a new religion or not? And that cannot be established by reason. How do I know that the religion of Prophet Nuh is no longer sufficient for humanity? I can never know. Or that the religion that Prophet Musa السلام, was sent with to humanity is now requiring an update. That there are things in it that need to be modified, that need to be complemented or supplemented, so that this is going to be useful in 10 centuries or 30 centuries from now. You can't know that. And that's why here the author says very quickly, because this is something, the universality and the finality of the religion, because we cannot establish it with reason alone, and now we explained why, we're going to heavily rely on the Holy Quran for the rest of the lesson. Okay, and so the rest of the lesson is mainly going to be based on the Quranic argument or the scriptural argument. Now we're going, now that we've established the validity of the Quran, we can go back to it and see what does it say about the universality of Islam and what does it say about Islam being the final or eternal religion. Otherwise, I would not be able to rely on my mind alone and study Islam and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never send another religion again. He needs to tell me that. I can't just guess that. After the fact, it's easy. Now that God has told me he will not send, when I go and study Islam, I can say, yeah, I understand why he's not sending. Because I, I have everything I need in here. But he needs to tell me that. Okay? Okay, I can, I can, we can move to the next. Okay. So the first part of the lesson, as we said, is that Islam is a universal religion. <coughs> so what's the argument for that? If someone wants to say, how do I know that Islam is actually a universal religion? Good for all people. Good for people living today. And not sent for a specific group of people or people living at a certain location or a cer in a certain point in time. How do I know that? First thing is, there is a unanimous consensus, not only within Muslims, but from anyone who studies Islam objectively, that there has been a claim, Islam has presented itself to the world from day one as being a universal religion. And we'll come back to the day one part. Because it did not start out as a universal religion. But it doesn't mean that that wasn't the plan all along. But at some point, it became clear that this religion is sent for all of humanity. From that point on, there has never been a doubt that Islam claims to be, at least claims to be, a universal religion. So the reason we're mentioning this is basically the author saying no one should doubt whether Islam presents itself as a universal religion or not. That part should be well understood and well accepted by all. Because some people even today, they will claim that Islam was never meant to be. Islam did never tried to become a universal religion. It was sent to a specific group of people living at a specific period in time. No. Islam presented itself after the initial period of the call of the Holy Prophet, the, the mission, after that uh, early period where he was sent to his tribe and then to the Arabs living around him, it became a universal call. And we'll talk about that in a second. A little bit later in the, in the lesson. Once it became a universal call, and that happened early enough, since that point on, it's been very clear to all, whether you have accepted the call or not, you know that this call to this religion is also a presentation of itself as being a universal religion. There is a claim within Islam from day one, the moment it became a universal call, from that point on, no one has ever doubted. So no one should come today and say, it never meant to become. No, that's not true. From day one, it was. <coughs> the claim was that it was going to be a universal religion. Okay? That's first things. The second part is, if we study the life of the Holy Prophet and how he preached, early on, his preaching was very, very limited. It was to people within his own family and his own clan and tribe. And then slowly it expanded to the tribes around. And then slowly, but surely, it expanded to 
a much larger sphere and the Holy Prophet started writing letters to kings and leaders of very big empires such as Persia and Egypt and in Africa and the Romans and Byzantium and elsewhere he started writing letters to them calling them to enter into Islam if Islam is only to be sent to a specific group of people let's say the Arabs living around the Holy Prophet then why would he be inviting all these different nations which were the great nations the Arabs were not a great nation yet these were the great nations of the world and many of them you know mocked the call because these are the little unknown Arabs living in the desert and they're calling them and telling them enter into our religion if you want to live a peaceful life who are you and what are you writing to me about and yet we see from early on the Holy Prophet's call was universal so he is inviting all of these different civilizations nations empires early on to enter into religion so again this is a second argument to clearly establish that the call from the beginning was a universal call okay and here I just added this from uh, this is a book that if if you have if you can read Arabic it would be an excellent book for anyone to go and study there are now attempts to start showing some of these writings to the world I've seen a few of them but not in this way so the only book that I'm aware of that has done this in a very scholarly way is the covenants of the Prophet by a professor right now and the book is very well known uh, Professor Andrew Morrow he's been uh, uh, promoting his book and it's going very well it's an amazing book where he's taken some of the treaties of the Holy Prophet with Christians and uh, other people living in his time to show the nature of those treaties and basically the philosophy of Islam from those treaties but here we want to talk a little bit more specifically about the call to enter into this religion those treaties and that's why I wanted to talk about another book but to my knowledge there I, I'm not aware of any English books that specifically address this the book is called Makatib and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Makatib al Rasul or Makatib al Nabi Sheikh Ahmed al uh, Sheikh Ali Ahmadi al Mayanji it's four volumes and he's tried to collect in there all the actual letters treaties <coughs> Uh, things written by the Holy Prophet himself and sent to different leaders companions some of them but the majority of them are to leaders of tribes or leader of the world okay so here I just wrote a couple of them that if he had a heading in there where he mentions that there are at least 50 letters sent to some of the big leaders of his time and he, he basically gives the, the reference to, to them so that's about 50 of them and then he mentions another 80 treaties written to people to talk about either their peace treaties or uh, explaining different things so these are just general letters let's say from the Holy Prophet to someone else and then he goes into more detail in, in the, the other volume the next volume he actually gives the text for 30 or maybe 32 31 or 32 of them he actually gives the text that was sent from the Holy Prophet to the Emperor in you know Byzantium or Persia or Egypt and then this is where you actually see what the Holy Prophet is saying so it's not one or two or three or five these are dozens of letters sent from the Holy Prophet to the people at that time who were considered the leaders of the world and we don't know how many more there might have been these are the ones that we have today we have the text the integral text of those and we see that the Holy Prophet is basically making his call very universal he's sending them to all the big leaders of the world at that time so no one can come back and say the Holy Prophet's call was not universal okay and then keeping all of this in mind the author goes over this very very quickly but we detailed it a little bit more so he says even with those let's put that aside now let's look at the Holy Quran itself so yes all, everybody should be unanimous about the fact that Islam's call should have was universal from the beginning there's no doubt about that two if we look at the manner in which the Holy Prophet preached and taught his religion there was a universal dimension to it and one of the best examples of it are these letters that the Holy Prophet sent and three and most importantly that's the main argument what does the Quran itself say about itself and about Islam 
So here, again, we're not going to repeat. We've already established that the Qur'an is authentic. And most importantly, we now know that if we want to know the true teachings of Islam, before I go to someone's opinion, before I even go to the narrations, with all the issues that we have with narrations, let's see what the Qur'an clearly says about it first. So here we have a few categories. One category of the verses is simply the manner in which the Holy Qur'an addresses people. When it wants to talk about a specific teaching of Islam, it addresses clearly, it targets an audience. The, Qur the Holy Qur'an is very clear with that. At times it says, it talks about women, and it addresses them. At times it talks about the wives of the Holy Prophet. At times it talks about to directly to O you who have believed. So every teaching, every message, every communication has a very targeted audience. And yet within there, we also find in many, many teachings and many messages of the Holy Qur'an that the targeted audience is humankind. So here we have a few examples of these. We have some verses that talk to humankind in general. It says, O oh humankind, Ya ayyuhan nas, all of you. We have other verses, and of course there's a reason why sometimes it says nas, there's, we're not going to go into the tafsir now, but something to keep in mind. The Holy Quran doesn't randomly say here, Ya bani Adam, so O oh children of Adam. But again, it's a universal call. Except that the nature of the topic requires that you are reminded that you are the sons of Adam. Because it talks about Satan, and it talks about, okay? And then that it is, this is a guidance. So some verses just specifically, uh, gen generically or generally, they talk to humankind. And then some verses, they add a component that this is your guidance as humanity. It's not just we're talking to you, so that you're all being addressed in general. No, here you're being addressed specifically for your guidance, for your spiritual salvation. And then there is, I'll, I'll come back to the, uh, to the rest. So some verses that speak directly to human beings in general. O humankind, indeed we created you from a male and a female and made you nations and tribes that you may recognize one another. The very famous verse in Surah Al-Hajarat. Indeed, the noblest of you before Allah is the most god weary Very general. It gives you a philosophy of Islam. There is not a lot of ordering and commanding and teaching here, but it also gives you the general principles of this religion. Okay? And the general principles are being given to all of humanity. Another verse, O humankind, worship your Lord. Now, we have an order. So it's not only that the Qur'an is talking to people, now it's starting to instruct them. Whether you have believed in this religion or not, formally entered it or not, I am asking you as a human being to worship your Lord. So this is the proof that this is a universal call. <coughs> this is not a call to a specific group of people. If you enter into the definition of humankind, then you are included in, you are being targeted by this message. O humankind, be wary of your Lord who created you from a single soul in Surah An-Nisa. O humankind, you are the ones who stand in need of Allah, and so on and so forth. Okay. Sir, say, sir, yes. Sir, if you just go back to this last slide. Yeah. Be wary of your Lord who created you from a single soul. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered about that verse. Single soul as in you share one soul? Or single soul as in he created us like the wine in one soul. <laughs> So basically, the, the quick tafsir of this, but this requires a huge, <laughs> lengthy lesson on tafsir of the first ayah of Surah An-Nisa. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying that you are all made of the same substance. Okay. That's the easy, simple interpretation of the verse. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then the verse continues and says, and from it he created males and females to be scattered. وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا So from it he created its <coughs> mate. And then he scattered many males and females from them. 
but this would require a very lengthy discussion of all the different interpretations that we can get out of this verse. So, but I guess one argument is that we all share one soul. Yeah. Soul. Yeah. So you and I are not made of different substances. Our origin comes from one soul, one nafs. Other verses, these ones are the ones that say, O children of Adam. So, O children of Adam, let not Satan tempt you as he caused your parents to exit from the garden. Or, did I not exhort you in Surah Yasin, did I not exhort you, O children of Adam, saying, Do not worship Satan, he is indeed your manifest enemy. La ta'budu shaytan, wa na'buduni hadha siratun mustaqeem. Verses that talk about general guidance to human beings. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the month of Ramadan is one in which the Qur'an was sent down as guidance hudan nas It's not guidance to the Muslims, those who have accepted the call. hudan nas the guidance is general. If you are part of Nas, if you're a human being, then this is guidance for you. Again, next verse about the Qur'an, a book we have sent down to you that you may bring humankind out of darkness into light. Another verse, this is a proclamation for humankind so that they may be warned thereby. Another verse, certainly we have made this Qur'an interspersed with every kind of parable for humankind. And in Surah Al-Hashr, had we sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have surely seen it humbled and go to pieces with the fear of Allah. We draw such comparisons for humankind. So al-amthal, these analogies or parables or comparisons are for humankind so that they may reflect. And then we have many verses of the Qur'an that simply say that the Qur'an, that all of this is a reminder for al-alameen. So this could be interpreted or translated as all the nations, all the people, all the worlds, okay, al-alameen, right? The same term that we use in Surah Al-Fatiha. And here we have a, a number of verses. And then let's look specifically at the mission of the Holy Prophet. What does the Quran say about it? Was he sent with a prophetic mission to all people? So now we looked at the Quran itself. We looked at the general teachings. Now let's look at the mission of the Holy Prophet in being sent with this religion to people. Is he sent to all people or only a group? And we sent you as a messenger to humankind. Say, O oh humankind, I am only a manifest warner to you. We did not send you except as a bearer of good news and a warner to all humankind. Blessed is he who sent down the criterion, the Furqan, to his servant that he may, that he may be a warner to Al-Alamin, to the worlds. And this is a very important, all of these uh, verses, uh, the, the author doesn't actually list them, we're listing them to detail the lesson. But this one he, he mentions, he says, this Quran has been revealed to me that I may warn thereby you and whomever it may reach. So he says this verse 619 is very clear that the Qur'an is not only being sent to the people who are receiving the Qur'an but whomever is going to one day be reached by the Qur'an. Whomever will reach the Qur'an or the Qur'an will reach them, the Qur'an is sent to them. And this proves that it is universal. Regard, there are no other conditions. If the Qur'an reaches you, then you are included, you are targeted, and you are the audience. If the Qur'an reaches you. Okay? And this Qur'an has been revealed to me that I may warn by the Qur'an, thereby you. So those are the Arabs that the Holy Prophet was talking to directly, addressing directly, and whomever it may reach. Okay? So this, this verse is very important. Yes? With the, the universality of, of Islam, it could be more easily understood if we were to discuss Imam Mahdi 
when the entirety of the earth is exposed to this reality and then they decide to accept or reject in a more open level but in today's time and previous times let's say maybe there's been 10 billion people on earth <coughs> and let's just for the sake of argument let's just even assume even to show you was the right madhab within Islam so the universality would have only been in tr sh shared by let's say 500 million people that have ever been Shia out of the 10 billion that have ever existed it sounds not so universal you know I, I didn't understand the argument like there's only 500 million the Shia shell is different than what actually happened in comparison to the 10 billion of humans that have existed so this, it seems like it's a universal message, but it hasn't reached universal. But we talked about that, and it's the same argument that is uh, the objection about prophethood. So a prophet is sent, and people may or may not enter. And there are people who create obstacles in the path of prophets preventing others from ever getting access to that knowledge. So is that a shortcoming on, on who? It's only part of the natural order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> created that now we have to live with these consequences of people blocking the message. There are obstacles that have been put in place by people and they're n they are responsible for that and the others are responsible for their actions. That's one part of the argument. But I don't know, if do you mean so basically this would only become possible at the end of times and until then there's no universality? I think I'm confusing universality with majority. Yes. Maybe something could be universal and a huge minority. So we're not saying that something is universal as in meaning everybody's going to accept it. Okay, we're exactly saying universal. Right? We're saying it's universal in the sense that when God sent this religion, He sent it to all people. Yeah. We're talking about the obligation of following Islam. Okay. Who has to follow Islam? That's the question. Is it a universal call? Can someone say, I'm not an Arab, I'm not included. The Quran is in Arabic, I'm not an Arab, it's not talking to me. I wasn't born 14 centuries ago in, in Arabia, the Quran is not talking to me. I live today, I need something that, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send me something, He needs to send it to me now. Downtown Toronto, you know? <laughs> like, the, uh, otherwise, it, I'm not included. So what we're trying to establish when we're saying it's universal, we're only trying to establish that the duty to study and hopefully to enter into Islam and to follow its teachings <coughs> is a universal duty. Okay. This is not a specific uh, duty, let's say, or responsibility mm -hmm. to one group uh, uh, at the exclusion of everybody else. Because they were alive at a certain point in time or a certain we're place say, on earth. Say, well, it doesn't mean that people are going to accept. But it doesn't matter whether you accept or not is, is irrelevant. The call is sent to you. That's what we need to establish. Okay. That the guidance has been sent to you. Now you may choose not to accept, that's up to you. No issue with that. It doesn't take away from the universal, the universality of the duty that you have. Okay? And the finality is that there's not going to be something else that will come after it that will basically abrogate it, that will change it. Who knows, maybe God sent something after and it says you no longer have to, you know, five years after the passing of the Holy Prophet, God sends another religion and says, you no longer need to follow this religion. That's it. This religion is over, just like previous religions were over. You no longer need to follow it, you're done. Who says this didn't happen? So we need both of these to say, and therefore the call to Islam, the invitation from Islam, is still as valid today as it was 14 centuries ago. That's all we're trying to say. Okay. okay? Minutes, so yeah. let's keep the question till the end. Okay. So the prophetic mission. Uh, I think we finished all of these. So let's go back to the end. I'm going to keep it to the people of the book. I'm not going to talk about it here. In the lesson, the, prophet, the, the author talks about how the Holy Quran specifically talks to the people who have received scriptures before. So it addresses them. So that no one can come back and say, well, they have their own book and they get to choose whether they enter into Islam or not. Okay? I'm keeping that till the end for a specific reason, to answer an objection. To summarize all of this, there are verses in the Qur'an, more than one, that clearly state 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending this religion so that he elevates it over all religions. And if we wanted to go in depth in the tafsir of that, then we would include everything we've already said. So everything that has to do with universality would be included in there. Would be included in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's once we've established the authenticity of the Qur'an, that it's valid, that this is the Qur'an sent from God, then God tells you that I'm sending this religion to you, this scripture to you, all these teachings to you, to elevate them over every other scripture, over every other set of teachings, over every other religion, then who can come back and say, this is not universal? And this is not only universal in, let's say, to all religions, but it's also <laughs> universal, and this is the second point, the same, the same wording and the same verses that talk about the elevation over everything else will be used for the finality, which is what we're going to do now. So this is our transition. So this is not only going to be elevated over everything else now, at the moment of revelation and in the future, but until the end of times. And this is the link to your question. And I thought this is where you were going. And we're going to talk about it. So the finality. Again, not in the same order in the book, but to make it a little bit clear. First thing is, just like there is a unanimous acceptance that Islam is a universal call, there is also a unanimity that Islam is a final religion. No one has ever doubted that. Now you may say it's true or it's not true, but the claim that Islam presents itself as a final religion has been clear from day one. So already no one should be doubting that part. Okay? The second thing is, all the verses of the Qur'an that we saw and every other verse in the Qur'an, nowhere do we see any exclusion from the Qur'an about, or any limitations in the teachings of the Qur'an, uh, let's say in time, temporal limitations. That this is only going to be valid for, I don't know, the people living in this time. There is not a hint or an indication that there is anything specific about the temporality of, of Islam. That this is only going to be temporary. Nothing in the Qur'an like that. So this is more the negative argument. Okay? When we look, we don't see anything there that says the Qur'an and its teachings or this religion are limited in time. The three, the third is the verses of the Qur'an that actually talk about this just like we had in the verses about universality, are very clear that this is going to be the final religion. This is going to be the religion that will remain valid and that will remain in effect, just like Allah remains in effect or not. It remains in effect until the end of times. <coughs> Some verses, it is he who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it prevail over all religions, though the polytheists should detest it. And there are, the wording in the, the other verses differs slightly, but the message is the exact same. Another verse, of the, or two verses of the Qur'an, it is an unassailable scripture. No falsehood can approach it from before it or from behind it. لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه So this could mean different things. From behind it or after it. Okay? It is sent down by one full of wisdom worthy of praise. And so here, what the verse is saying is that there is nothing in the Qur'an that can be ever contradicted or weakened by any scripture sent before it or anything that will come after it. <coughs> Basically saying that it remains in effect forever. Okay, so the, the author concentrates on uh, this verse. لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه How does that have to do with other... Uh, oh, okay. So it means that there is nothing in it that will ever change. Oh. It's all truth. There is no batal. There is no place to batal in it. Okay? Um, so it doesn't lose validity or authority. And then keep in mind that next lesson we'll talk about what, it, what do we mean when we say khatamiyyah. Okay? The seal of prophethood. That the Holy Prophet is the seal of prophets or khatam al anbiya. This is where we finish this argument fully, when we talk about that, okay? And then the fourth point, or the fourth argument for us to say that this religion is final, eternal, 
is where the author says, and he doesn't mention any, but he says we have many, many narrations, and we do have many narrations, that very clearly state that this religion is going to be the religion that remains in effect until the end of times. And so the very famous one is whatever has been made halal, licit to Muhammad will remain licit until the day of judgment. Halal Muhammadin halal ila yawm al qiyamah wa haramuhu haramun ila yawm al qiyamah. This has been mentioned in different wordings and in different shapes and forms in multiple narrations. And then the spirit of that is also in many, many other narrations. So that topic should be very, very clear, unanimous, accepted, and very well supported by the Holy Quran and the narrations. Okay, now the objections, the main objections. And so the author lumps them together very quickly in one paragraph, all the objections, and all the answers are in a couple of paragraphs. So we're splitting them in the right order. The first objection is there are people who will look at the Quran, specific verses of the Quran, and they will say, the Quran tells the Prophet to call only certain people to his religion. So for instance, call those of your tribe or your clan who are the closest to you, call them to religion. <coughs> Other verses of the Quran, they talk about the Arabs living in Mecca, specifically Umm al-Qura. It says, so that you may warn the mother of cities and those around it. And we have two verses in the Quran specifically talking about that. We have other verses of the Qur'an that talk about this, this group, these specific Arabs. So it says that you may warn a people to whom there did not come a warner before you. Okay, but there are people who had a warner before. So he's not sent to them. Because this verse says he's only sent to the people that have never had a warner. So if you're a Christian, if you're a Jew, it doesn't apply to you. He's not sent to you. Okay, so there are people who will look at these verses of the Quran and say, and therefore, he was sent to specific people, he's not sent to all people. And then, of course, some people will say that, yes, there are verses in the Quran that may give the impression that it's a universal call, that everybody's included in the call of the Quran, but the truth is, these verses tell us the specifics. So these are the only people that the Quran was really sent to, they, they call it in Arabic takhsis. Okay, so you say something very general, but then how, who's, what are the exceptions and how it applies specifically is explained elsewhere. So we have that in fiqh, we have that in just the manner in which we talk as human beings, and we'll give an example to that. So this is the main obje first objection. The call is not actually universal, and there are proofs in the Quran that it is not a universal call. The answers to that. The first one is, if someone really studies how the Holy Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet and the phases of the mission of the Holy Prophet, we see that it went through waves or phases of the teachings that the Holy Prophet was sharing with the world. So yes, when, the whole, when Islam started, the order, the command of the Holy Prophet was to only call to this religion those who are closest to him from his own tribe. He had to present it to Bani Hashim and then to Quraysh. That's his only mandate at that time. When Islam started to grow enough, the Holy Prophet started to make it, and this is at some point we call it, if one day inshallah we go into the in-depth studying the life of the Holy Prophet, they say that there was a secret mission that may have lasted between one and three years. Okay, this was a call to Islam that the Prophet would not walk around and just invite people to Islam. He did it very selectively one-on-one, -on -one, here and there. And then after that period, the Holy Prophet started calling those who that he thought should be called to Islam in that, let's say, the nation of Arabs in general, are these different clans and tribes of Arabs, beyond his own. Okay, so this is phase two. Phase three, this is when he went to the rest of the world. And this is where it became a universal call. And he started writing letters to emperors and kings and priests and people who are considered very big social and religious leaders in the world. Okay? So no one can come back and look at these verses and say, the, Qur or the Quran tells him only call the people of your own tribe. Yeah, there was a phase early where those were the only people who were called. 
But that Islam did not stop there. It continued to expand, and as a, as it grew, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would tell the Prophet when it was time to move to the next phase. And at the end, by the time he passed away, he had reached the phase where this had become a universal call to humanity. The second thing is we cannot, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We cannot look at the verses uh, that clearly state that the call is universal, some of which we looked at now, and say that these verses are going to specify them, limit them. It doesn't work. There are grammatical issues with it, and this is not how human beings talk. I can't look at the verses of the Qur'an that say, this is a guidance to all of humankind, uh, this o uh, children of Adam, so on and so forth, the verses that we saw, and then come to these verses and say, see? There's a limitation. It's not really all children of Adam that it's talking to. It's only talking to his family. It doesn't work. Okay, and I think it should be intuitive enough that we don't need to go through the reasons why, the, the grammatical reasons why. And then the third thing is, you cannot say that this is just a figure of speech. So you're generalizing, but you're generalizing for the minority. And this is the, the, the argument. So someone may say, for instance, the verses of the Qur'an, they may seem to be addressing everyone, but the, it's just a figure of speech, and then we are told who the specifics are. Who is it really specifically addressing? Why? So the, I just wrote a quick example here. Let's say I tell my son, son, honor everyone. Okay, so that's one statement I gave him one day. And a couple of days later, I come back, and now I'm going to give him the specifics. I'm going to tell him, what I really meant by everyone is your family. Well, you, that's a very small minority. Everyone is a very, very comprehensive term. And your family represents a nothing in that ocean of people. It does not make sense to say, honor everyone when you really mean your family. But if I meant, let's say, honor everyone, and then a few days later I come back and I say, oh, I meant accept the arrogance. People who are arrogant don't honor them. Okay, well, that's, that's a minority. It's okay to exclude it later. It still works. The generalization still works, and I gave you another criteria to make sure you apply. It's an exception. And it's really an exception. It's a very small minority. Only the arrogant people are not to be honored. That's good. It works. <laughs> okay, the second objection. The second objection is they say all religions are good. So we look at the verses of the Quran, we look at Islam in general, and we say that Islam says anyone who follows any religion is going to enter paradise, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make sure that they are going to have a happy life and a happy afterlife. So we have one of the verses of the Qur'an about this. Indeed, the faithful, the Jews, the Sabians, the Christians, those who have faith in Allah in the last day and act righteously, they will have no fear, nor will they grieve. So that's a clear verse in the Qur'an that says, anyone who follows any of these faiths is going to live a happy life in this world and a happy life in the next world. The first thing here to keep in mind is, the point of this verse is basically to say what matters for your happiness and your salvation in this world and the next is not which religion you adhere to. Just saying I'm a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, that counts for nothing. What really matters is to have true faith and to act righteously. So don't say I'm a Muslim, I'm a faithful, so I, I've entered Islam, or I, I'm a Jew, I'm a Christian, and thinking that that's going to be enough for your salvation. That's the point of the verse. That's what the verse is saying. It's not saying anyone who is saying, I am a Jew, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, <coughs> therefore is going to never have any fear and never going to grieve. The point is, you have to have true faith and you have to act righteously. First of all, that's the point of the verse. The second thing is, we've already said, that there is a duty for every human being that applies to them. So if I happen to live at a time when my duty was to become a Jew, 
then Judaism is a religion I need to follow at that time. And the same thing applies to the Sabian, and the same thing applies to the Muslim and the Sabian, same thing applies to the Christian. Okay? So from there, we could very easily interpret the verse as saying, when it was the proper time for you to be a Jew, if you were one of those Jews to whom it applies to be a Jew at the time you're supposed to be a Jew, then you are included in this verse. And the same thing applies to the Muslim and the same thing applies to everybody else. Okay, so it's not a carte blanche, uh, free for all that you may choose whichever one of these religions. Otherwise it would contradict everything else we just said, right? Mm -hmm. And then keep it in mind, what is the duty today? So someone may say, okay, fine, so what's my duty today? So keep that in mind, we're going to answer that, especially for the Jews and Christians. The last argument, the last objection, is that they say in Islamic law, there's a very clear distinction between people who are atheists and polytheists on the one <laughs> side, and people who are Ahlul Kitab. Right? So Ahlul Kitab, you are to be as much as possible in common with them, in unity with them, be close to them, don't be at war, don't create fights, try to be living peacefully, coexisting, and so on and so forth. Like there's a very strong encouragement for that. And the laws that apply to these different communities in a real Islamic state all are also different, right? So if you're living on Islamic land, but you don't want to enter Islam, but you do have a sacred book that you're following, then you don't have to pay the Islamic taxes. You don't pay khums, you don't pay zakah, but you pay another ta tax that applies to you because you're not paying those, so that you continue to live in that land, okay? So when they look at that, they say, don't, how can you say that all of them are in the same boat? They're not all in the same boat. You can't say that the atheist and the polytheist and Ahlul Kitab, any book that they may have, are all the same. Because they're all non-Muslims, therefore they're all the same. Right? So we're saying you have to be a Muslim. They're saying, well, Islam actually distinguishes. It says, I respect you if you have a, your own holy book. The call does not include you. You can remain and keep your religion in place. No need to enter Islam. That's the objection. So we're saying, no, that's not what, the, what Islam said. Okay? The answer. The first and, you know, the bottom line is, this does not necessarily mean that Islam is saying, your faith is accepted, your creed is accepted. Islam does not want to create bloodshed and problems and fitna and war and, 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 where it is not needed. There should be enough commonality for people who believe in sacred books to live peacefully in a way that does not contradict and go against the basic values and the basic principles of anyone who follows any of these scriptures. So social life is possible without betrayal and without hypocrisy and without social issues. So there is no need for this world to work as it's supposed to, to create fights where we don't need to. This is very different from saying, this is very practical, social, political reasons, very different from saying, therefore they're all the same. All Ahlul Kitab, including Muslims, they're all the same. And those who don't have a book, are they're all the same. No, no, no. We're not talking about whether your faith is valid or not. That's a separate topic. Now we're talking about a social system that works. Where you can actually apply and live by all the principles, and they can live by their principles, and there are no issues. You can actually establish that kind of world. And there are no issues. That's all it's talking about. So this is very practical. It's not talking about whether your faith is accepted or not. That's between you and God. The verses are not talking about this. Okay? And whether your faith is accepted or not, we'll see in a second. And then the second thing is, and this is a link to your question, the second thing is, the Qur'an made it clear that at the end, the point of all of this, this revelation, is that at the end, it's almost like a divine promise, so that it may prevail over all religions. Has it prevailed over all religions? Not really. So this is where, if you combine it with the Shia narrative, this is where you get that this has not happened yet. And it will happen. When it will happen, when Imam al-Mahdi reappears, 
then we will see what that verse really means. When we will see what is supposed to be the end of history, what is supposed to prevail? Does it actually prevail or not? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create an order in which his religion does prevail in the end like he intended or not? Yeah. So I'm sure it's connected. This is the verse of the Quran that we and the followers are of truth are always few. So at the same time we discuss his universality, but at the same time is yeah, it does, valid. but again I would say make sure you don't combine mm -hmm. or don't confuse between how many people enter. Yeah, that's not the issue. Yeah. Those are thankful are few. Yes. Etc. Etc. Yeah. Okay. Huh? So. Yeah. <coughs> so the last question we have with this is: So what is the duty of the others? So if we said there is Islam and there are the others and we're saying it's not as simple as saying Islam yes it does distinguish between the atheists and polytheists because it's basically saying there is absolutely no common ground between you and them where it really matters the only common ground you have is with the people who have a sacred book and with the others there is absolutely no common ground here so what about those who have the sacred book? Does it say anything or not? Does it stay silent about them? Or does it say they are supposed to do something? They are supposed to be included in the call and feel that they are included in the call to Islam. <coughs> so if we go to some verses of the Quran, O people of the book, certainly our messenger has come to you clarifying the divine teachings for you after a gap in the appearance of the messengers. Lest you should say, there did not come to us any bearer of good news, nor any warner. Certainly there has come to you a bearer of good news and a warner, and Allah has power over all things. Another verse. O people of the book, certainly our uh, apostle or our messenger has come to you clarifying for you much of what you used to hide of the book and excusing many an offense of yours. Certainly there has come to you a light from Allah and a manifest book. Maybe it's still not clear enough. You are the best nation ever brought forth for humankind. You bind or you bid, alaykum wa rahmatullah, you bid what is right and forbid what is wrong and have faith in Allah and if the people of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. We're not going to force them. We're, gonna, we're not going to say I will impose on you to believe or not. But if the people of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. Among them, some are faithful, but most of them are transgressors. The last verse, O people of the book, why do you defy Allah's signs while you testify to their truth? And later, the next verse, O people of the book, why do you clothe or mix the truth with falsehood and conceal the truth while you know? And a few verses later, say, O people of the book, why do you defy the signs of Allah while Allah is witness to what you do? When you look at verses like this, <coughs> Can someone really come back and say, yeah, the Qur'an has nothing to do with the people of the book. It's telling them, you know, keep your scripture and keep your religion and keep your faith. You're not included in the mission. Or is it telling them you need to enter into this religion as well? But we're not going to force you. Because we think there is already enough common between us, okay? So I hope that part is clear. And then we will talk, inshallah, in the next lesson about what do we mean when we say the Holy Prophet is the seal of prophets and this topic of finality or finalizing the chain of prophethood and messengers.